everyone for joining us for our webinar today. Uh, my name is Tom Robbins. I'm with PlayFab, and I want to welcome everyone to getting started with PlayFab. Um, our speaker today, Brendan, is our senior uh, developer success engineer here at PlayFab. And uh, if you, you've talked to Brendan, you know that he's highly passionate about helping developers get started. So I want to turn it over to Brendan. Uh, we will be taking questions in the panel, and we'll ask them maybe towards the end, or uh, you know, I might interrupt Brendan as we go along. Um, but as always, we look forward to any questions. So without further ado, Brendan. Hi, everybody. So as Tom said, I'm Brendan. I'm a senior developer success engineer. And what that means is I'm effectively your technical rep, or let's just say your primary technical rep. There's a team of us here working to help out you get your games working on our service. Um, if you've been in our forums or you work with us through our DevRel alias, you've probably encountered me at least once already. Now, this is going to be the first of a series of technical webinars that we'll be doing to go into different topics on how to use our service. This first one will be all about how to get started and some of the fundamental concepts of data in our service. If you've got suggestions for what you'd like to see for future webinars, uh, please send them to webinars at playfab.com. All right, and with that, so here's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to show you how to get started, get your account set up, configure your game, how to start making API calls with Postman, and if you have, haven't heard of that before, don't worry, I'll talk about that a bit more, how to manage title and user data in the service, and give you some recommendations on best practices for using data in our service. So to start with, here's our site. Uh, the main page, pretty straightforward. Just click the sign up now for free. Uh, that'll take you to the screen that you see on the right where you'll enter your email address, set up a password, click the terms of service button, and create your account. Uh, once you've created your account, you'll also be able to set two-factor authentication on the account if you want to keep it really secure. And additionally, I'll show you on the, uh, the, the title page in a moment, you'll be able to add people to your studio as well. Uh, when you uh, yes, when you create your email address, I was just checking to make sure. You see where it says Brendan plus webinar 001 at playpub.com. Uh, that's not really so much necessary for you as developers, but I will just highlight that uh, a lot of mail tools we use Google a lot um, give you the ability to specify an email address with that sort of plus and some other string after it. Uh, what that email address is doing is it's going to send all emails to brendan at playfab.com regardless of what's after the plus. So that's really great for creating tons and tons of test accounts in the system because then if you're doing anything where you're going to be sending messages out to customers in your game and you need to test that functionality, you can just create a whole bunch of test accounts using that mechanism. Okay, once you've created your account, we're going to send you an email. The email is just typical verification email just to uh, make sure we complete the loop and you can set up your account that way. Just click the link, it'll set you up and you'll be on your main page for your studio. Okay, now a studio is where all the titles you've created in our service are going to appear. When you first join PlayFab, you're going to see a screen that's going to look very much like what's on the left, except you'll have your own unique title ID. It'll be unnamed studio and an unnamed title. You'll be able to use the little gear icon there. Those are both drop downs for configuration options. You'll be able to use those to set the name of your studio and the name of your title. But also, and I wanted to call these out in particular, you can use them to add additional users to your studio. And you can use it to, like you see on the right, rename your title, give it the website, Hide game specifically is to hide the game from that screen on the left. So if you've created an extra title and you don't want it cluttering up your view because it's not really important, maybe it's a test title you're not using at the moment, you can just select hide game to get it out of your view. You'll also notice that at the top, there's a bunch of links taking you to information on how to integrate, how to make your API calls, and how to enhance your game. These go to a lot of great information uh, that we have on our documentation pages, our SDK pages, um, all about how to use our service and how to make the most of it. Also, across the top, uh, you'll see the profile option that gives you the ability to make any edits that you need to your profile. 
alerts is where you'll see any kind of messages that we're sending out to our community, and in particular uh, about the uh, the releases of our, our uh, functionality. I'm sorry, I'm just checking a question here. Ah, okay, so great question. Somebody has asked about deleting the title. Um, what I will say about that is, so the environment that you're looking at right now is the live environment. That doesn't mean that your game is live, obviously. You control when your game ships live, whether it's to the iTunes Store, Google Play, Steam, whatever. Um, when I say it's a live environment, what I mean is, all the titles are existing in that space. We are going to be adding a sandbox environment later on. When we add the sandbox environment, we'll be adding the ability to delete titles. Right now, the concern is the option to delete a title, if someone were to accidentally do that on a live title, that would be horrific. So we'd prefer to uh, protect people from that as much as possible. <clears throat> okay, so uh, back to the screen here. Um, there's also a feedback button at the top. So if at any point on any of the pages uh, in the game manager, which is what we refer to this, uh, this particular uh, set of control panels, as, you see anything that you feel is in error or could be improved, just click the feedback button and enter your, you know, the information about what your suggestion is. That all gets filed in our tracking system so that we can make sure to review them, uh, sort them so that we get uh, an aggregation of the recommendations that people are making. Because a lot of our prioritization is based upon trying to make sure that we're doing what the majority of our developers need. Okay, so with that, move on to title data. So the first of the types of data I'll show you here is the title data system. Uh, all of the uh, primary data systems are key value pair. Now this is an arbitrary string string system. So you can put anything you want. As you can see in the example that I've given, I put in uh, two, two keys, a sword and a gun, and each of them has a JSON definition of their parameters, so range and strength in this case. So you can put anything you need to into the string. It can take up to 128 kilobytes of data. Um, and you can have a large number of strings, I'll just put it that way. In the, in the free tier, there's a limitation. Uh, I'll have to double check the, the, uh, the actual limitation if you need some specifics on that. But uh, yeah, in the uh, other tiers outside free, we have the ability for you to store essentially thousands of, of uh, title key value pairs. Okay, so the title data is primarily used for configuration data generally. So this is information that you can set up for your title. Uh, as you see, like I put in the sword and the gun. This is data that all users are gonna be able to get by a simple API call. It can only be edited by you through the admin API calls. The admin API set is for configuration of your game. Since the clients can never edit it, it's secure data that you can use to set values that you want all the, uh, the clients to be able to pick up and use. So using data-driven systems for your game, you can set configuration data that you change later so that you can make changes to your game without having to go through recertification. And that'll save you a lot of time and money, I can tell you from experience. <laughs> now the title data can be for the individual title. And there's also the concept of publisher data, which can be shared across all your titles. And that's important because then the user data also is able to have data for the individual user or for all titles across your studio. Now, Let's talk a little bit about Postman, which is the tool that I commonly use to do a lot of my testing internally. Uh, if you go to the link at the top, www.getpostman.com, you'll be able to download the tool. Uh, this is a, a Chrome plugin or a standalone tool. You can use it either way. I personally prefer it as a standalone. Um, the screen there in the middle is the environment management screen. <clears throat> now what that is is when you start up Postman, you'll be able to set an environment. The environment contains all these variables. So these are all variables I've defined for my own use. Uh, 5F4 is my test title ID, for instance. Uh, I put in username, password uh, for accounts. Obviously, I've, I've put in some generic ones here for the sake of argument. Uh, secret key is the secret key for your title so that you'll be able to make uh, admin or server API calls using the, uh, the Postman tool. The environment at the bottom and the uh, CloudScript URL simply have to do with the uh, the URL endpoints that you'll be hitting. 
So the environment, Playtop API, goes along with the title ID to build out your URL. I'll show you an example of that in a sec. Cloud Script URL is specific to our Cloud Script system, which we'll be talking about in a future webinar. And in addition, I should point out that we'll be putting a collection of Postman calls into our SDK pages shortly. We're just finalizing it now. That collection is something you'll be able to import into Postman and gives you examples of every API call you can make against our service, along with some additional documentation that tells you how to use those calls. Okay, so using Postman, and right there on the right is an example Postman screen, you'll be able to create a user account, which is really the first step you're gonna to wanna to do after you've got your title set up in our service. So you can see I'm using the variables that I defined <coughs> on the previous screen in the URL. So you see where it says title ID. And then down below, again, title ID is part of this specific call. It needs to be in the body along with the username and password. I could actually also have the email as one of the variables in my definition, but for the purposes of my own testing, I tend to, uh, to bounce between a lot of different email addresses because I'm using a lot of different test accounts. So down below then, once you've made the call, You'll get back your response. A 200 is always going to be your success response. You'll see the PlayFab ID of the player that's been created, the username, and in the middle there is the session ticket. So the session ticket is the unique identifier for this account for the session that has been created by this login because a registration is also a login. Now the session ticket currently in our system lasts for 24 hours. So one thing that's important to note is that whenever you make any API call against our service on behalf of the client, you should be checking the results to make sure that the session ticket has not expired. If it has, you just use one of the login functions again, and you'll be able to get the user signed back in, you'll get a new session ticket, and you can use that one going forward. If you're using any of our SDKs, our SDKs automatically grab the session ticket when you make this call and put it into a global variable so that it is used for subsequent API calls without any extra work on your behalf, well, on your part, excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so once you've got your user account created, then you're able to read out your title data. So again, the title data is gonna be used for some configuration of your game, so that you'll be able to control, you know, the strength of things, the speeds of cars or, or planes or anything else, uh, and change it on the fly. So we made the call. The, the body on the right you'll see is completely blank and that's because there's nothing needed to get the title data. You can specify no key at all and you'll get back in return all the keys that are set up for your title. If you specify an individual key, so if I were to specify gun as the key I'm looking for and you can pass in an array, array of keys, the only one I would get back is gun. But I've left it blank so as you can see it returns everything. Okay. Now, user data. User data is gonna be used for a wide range of things, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But the basic way you set it is very similar to the title data. You just make the call to title ID, use update user data, and you set any arbitrary key value pairs that you want to for the player. In this case, I, excuse me, in this case I've chosen to, uh, to write out a progress or a, think of it as a, a save game, right? So it's your encoded save game data. And then a checksum, in case you wanted to additionally be able to do a, a checksum evaluation on that saved data to make sure that everything's good. Because as I'm sure any of you who've worked with the internet before <laughs> are well aware, uh, the internet is not the friendliest of beasts and it will drop packets on you from time to time. Uh, since all of our calls use SSL, you should minimally encounter that. The majority of the time, your call, your, the data that you get back should be fine, but it's always best just to play it safe. Okay, and reading the data out, again, it's just as easy as getting the title data. And again, I'm not specifying anything in the body. I split this into two screens so I can make them a little bit larger so that you could see the data in the, uh, the result because I wanted to talk about the, the specifics of what you get back when you query for the user data. So in this case, again, I didn't specify a key. I get back all the data on the user. Uh, because it's a brand new user account, you just saw the only data that I wrote to it, which was, the progress key and the progress checksum. Okay, so 
Within each one, you've got the value, so you've got the key value that was set. Uh, we also return to you the last updated time, so it's a timestamp of uh, the last time you, from the client side or server side, updated that particular key. And in addition, the last thing you see there is permission. So the permission is something you can set on any user data that can be read by the client. If the permission is private, which is the default, obviously, since I just wrote it out and I didn't specify, and you see these are both private. Uh, if it is private, that means that only a server call or a call made by the client that is associated with the data. So a client with a signed in user who is associated with the data can read the data. Anyone else would get an error back trying to read the same key. Alternately, you can set any user data that can be read by a client to public, and that means that any signed in user in our service can read it. So that's great for being able to set whether it's costumes or a uh, configured logo that you let people set up in the game. It lets people share data uh, in an effective way such that you can read the data for, and, well, anyone in the system. So here's the real meat of it, and this is we'll spend a good bit of time talking about this. Um, in general, our philosophy here is that if you give the client authority over something, you're going to get cheated. And really, it's not a matter of if, it's when and how often. And how often, that's going to be determined by how many users you have, frankly. Uh, the larger your user base, the more frequently you're going to see people attempting to cheat. So because of this, we've got multiple forms of data available to you for user-associated data in our system. There's read-write data, which is what I was just showing you in the previous example. When you call update user data, you're writing to the read-write space. That's data that can be read by the client, but it's also data that can be written to by the client. Only by the client associated with the data, to be clear. A client cannot write to another client's data space directly. So because the client can write to this particular data space, that means that if you were to put something there like save game information that contains something sensitive, you know, progress, or maybe the status of the person's inventory and all the equipment they have, that opens the door to players being able to write into it anything they want. Now, that's, that's not exactly the end of the world. There are plenty of games for which that's not going to be the worst thing that could happen. Uh, some games, uh, their advertise, sorry, excuse me, their revenue models are advertising supported. Uh, they don't have player-to-player -player competition of any kind. They don't use leaderboards. For games like that, really, the longer a player is playing your game, the better off you are. So you don't really have a concern about that. But for everybody else, there are the other forms of data. So read-only data is a data set that can be read by a client. And again, you can set it to public or private. But it can be read by the client, not written to by the client. So you would only write to these from a server-side operation, whether it's using your own custom game servers or CloudScript. Uh, we won't go into CloudScript in depth here, but I will say, if you're interested in learning more about that, just go to playfab.com, go to our features list, and look up CloudScript. Or if you're in our Game Manager, you can go to the Servers tab at the top. By default, when you create a, a title in our system, you'll get our demonstration, our example Cloud Script in your title so that you can use it for reference. It has basically a, a type of hello world. It shows how to write out user data. It shows how to use user data for that matter so that you can use that as a reference point. But again, we'll dive deeper into Cloud Script in a future webinar. Okay, so that's read-only data, and that's great for any data that the player needs to have access to, but you need to have server-side authority over the data to make sure that your players don't cheat. And then the last one is internal data. Internal data can't even be read by the client. It's data that can only ever be read by a server-side API call. That is a great place for you to store things like cheating information. If you've got some logic that you're using to track on potential cheating, so you want to make sure that you're, you're uh, recording information and then using it to make an evaluation of whether or not someone should, for example, be bucketed in a separate group 
for online gameplay because they've been identified as a cheater. And that's a great technique for uh, separating out your, your user base so that if you have uh, a, a large number of people who are cheating, or even a small number of people who are cheating, you can make sure they just play with each other. And they're not causing a problem for the rest of your user base. You can additionally use internal data for essentially anything else you want to track about the player that you don't want them to see. Uh, I will say that when you're writing out user data, regardless of where it is, whether it's read-write, read-only, or internal, you should always think through what the data is that you're going to be using and why. Uh, one caution, uh, you really shouldn't ever be writing personally identifying information of any kind out there. So don't write out email addresses or, or any other potentially personally identifying information. Even the full IP address is potentially personally identifying information. Uh, I just throw out this caution because you've probably seen plenty of times in the press over the, the last couple of years that a few titles have gotten in trouble for mishandling of PII. We track on uh, PII for players on your behalf, including the account information that they set up, IP addresses, things along those lines. But we're also on your behalf taking care of obfuscating that data appropriately according to the, the international laws that apply so that we're helping to protect your title for you. Okay. And then finally, uh, one thing I'll point out is that because the uh, user data as I said before, just like the, uh, the data you can set at the title level, the user data can be set at the title level or it can be set at the publisher level. If it's set at the publisher level, that means you can share it across all your titles. Uh, that's great for being able to have information about player took action A in title one. And because of that, you want to give them a special reward in title two. It's a great way to cross promote your games, encourage gameplay between games. And in terms of cross promotion in general, uh, having this information about what games your players have played gives you the ability to then be able to promote your other games without annoying the player by showing them games they've already played. And you can do that just by storing, you know, a single piece of key, a single key value pair in the publisher data area for each title, so that you have that as your checkpoint. So with that. I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions because I know that data in particular is one of those spaces where uh, we can go certainly as deep as you want. Uh, if you have additional questions, feel free to send them to Twitter at Place Out Network. Or go ahead and place them in your uh, place them in your right hand side. You should see a question panel. We actually have some questions in and um, I will look for uh, additional questions that people may have. Uh, the first question that we have is, um, Brendan, when you update strings, um, how quickly will that affect your game? So when you update a string in our system, whether it's title data or user data, that's actually updated immediately in the system. Uh, we do use caching for a number of components in our system, but uh, when it comes to that, those data sets, when you tell it, basically when you set that data up, that tells us that you immediately want to make that change to your, to your game. So one, for example, one recommendation I would make, um, if you're developing your game and you're testing out concepts to see whether or not some data change you want to make is the one that is going to be effective for you, I would recommend having a second title, have a test title in the system so that you can play around with it, make the changes that you need, test them out, and make sure everything's good. And then when you're ready to go live with it, you can go ahead and set that data in your live title. Okay, great. Um, for those people, please go ahead and continue submitting questions. Uh, let's see. Another question is, um, do you have a PII data type if we, went, if we want to add our own PII data? You know, we don't right now, and I'll tell you why. Uh, personal identifying information needs to be obfuscated. The, the rules I was referring to earlier are, um, it, it's an international set of, of rules. If you do a lot of investigation on it, what you'll find is the EU is where the rules are uh, generally the strongest around personal identifying information. And uh, if, you're, if, you're looking, if you're looking for more information, Germany in specific is where some of this comes from. The idea is that um, if you have done business with a person within the last two years, you have the right to their data, unless they've told you to specifically get rid of it. So within that two-year span, 
it's okay for you to have PII. But once you hit the end of the two-year span, you don't really have the right to it anymore. So <clears throat> what we do on our side is, as I said, we obfuscate the data. What that means is we take the data and we alter it in a way that makes it something that's still useful to you for the purposes of your reporting. But there's absolutely no way to actually then backtrace to get the identity of an individual. So I mentioned IP address as, the, as one example. An IP address gives too specific a location if you use one of the geo services. So what we do is we remove the last octet. So instead of it being 1.2.3.4, it's 1.2.3.0. That effectively eliminates the specific location, moves it out to uh, what's generally defined as a, a quote unquote state level. And they're using state as the, but in that definition to mean something the size of a state in the United States is the example. Um, that is no longer considered personally identifying information. Okay, so what does that mean for a PII data type? If we were to have a PII data type, the only thing we could do with it is to delete it, at which point it's no longer really useful information for you. So it is something we can consider if, as a matter of fact, let me put it this way. If there's enough people who feel that that's an important data type for us to have, where when it hits the two year mark, we just delete it and that's fine, then that's something we would be looking to add. Uh, so far, we haven't actually had it show up as a, as a request to us, but if that's something that would be important to you, let us know. Feel free to just email us at devrel at playfab.com and, and let us know that that's a feature that you feel would be good for your title. Great, another question just came in. Um, Brendan, are there any best practices you would recommend around reading user data? Should I try to read a lot of things, a little bit of things? I mean, do you have any, any thoughts around that? Well, it really comes down to the, the needs of your game. <clears throat> I will say that if you have tons and tons of user data, trying to read all of it at once is going to slow down the user experience, for one thing. Uh, and then for two, one thing to bear in mind is that uh, the, the way our system works Really, your call pattern should be that on average over the entire lifetime of the session, you should really only be making a call about every, oh, I don't know, two, three seconds, something along those lines. Uh, bursts of calls are absolutely fine. If you need to read a bunch of things at once, sure, go for it. Just over the length of the entire session for a single player, you want to make sure that you're spacing out the calls. Higher rates of calls become unsustainable over time. Uh, in general, actually, the only time we've ever seen a title have this problem is when there's been a bug in, in the title code, such that it's making calls that it doesn't intend to. Um, in terms of how you use data, generally speaking, you're going to have uh, a few pieces of data that you're going to want to know about you know, uh, throughout the course of the game, at different points of, of the interface, at different points of gameplay. That's information you'll want to just grab and store locally. Uh, if it's something that requires security, uh, the thing to bear in mind is that, sure, a hacked client could alter the data at any time. Um, it doesn't really give you any more security to read the data more frequently because all the, the hack client, all the person with the hack client is going to do is just change all the places where they read the data to set it to whatever they want to. The important thing is to make sure that any data that gets written to the service is secured. And you can do that using Cloud Script. Uh, you can do it using your own custom game server. In either case, what you'll do is you'll make sure to code your write operation such that whatever the client is telling you, you have enough checks in place and the right checks in place to make sure that the values are both sensible, reasonable, you know, all those things. Uh, you might check what, how much time has passed since the last time a player updated something. So is it reasonable that he could have finished a level and written up a new score in the amount of time that's passed? Uh, you could check the actual values against a range. So is it reasonable that the player could have reported the score that he did? Is he reporting too high of a score, too fast of a time on the racetrack? You know, any of those things. Great. Uh, another question just came in. Um, what would be the difference? I'm still trying to understand why I would use Cloud Script versus my own game server. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so Cloud Script is our own... It's our own uh, way for you to provide a uh, ho hosted solution for, for game logic. Think of it as being similar to Parse. Uh, what we do is we provide a space where you can write out any arbitrary uh, JavaScript uh, handlers that you want to and then post them in our service. Those handlers can be called 
uh, from the client. Or for those of you who are familiar with uh, Photon Cloud, which I'm sure we'll also have a webinar at some point about that. But if you're using Photon Cloud, we're also integrated with a webhook system so that whenever a user you know, creates a room or joins a room or leaves a room, you're able to have a, a, a Cloud Script handler which is automatically called. Okay, so you can write a very large number of handlers with a whole lot of logic in them. But because all of those are web API calls, they're not going to work exactly the same way as a, a hosted game server. Think of a hosted game server as something you would use for if you were running a Call of Duty type game. You're going to want to have a server which has a super low latency within uh, all the operations that it does. Uh, it needs to do a tremendous amount of CPU processing to determine you know, locations of players, resolve uh, whether it's firing uh, a weapon, whether or not it hits a target, uh, any kind of predictive algorithms you're making about player movement. Those are things that really are going to be best in your own custom game server logic as opposed to JavaScript. Okay, great. I do want to, we're, we're basically out of questions. I want to give everyone another minute or two. If you want to add in any additional questions for, for Brendan, please go ahead and send them in. Um, and as Brendan had said, uh, we are, we've got a whole series of webinars planned. So I think our next one is getting started with CloudScript. Um, you can find more information on those at playfab.com slash webinars. Uh, and as always, we will, uh, barring any major technical issues, we'll go ahead and, and post up this uh, video to our YouTube site within the next day or so and make it available. Uh, we're always looking for feedback on things. So with no more questions, uh, we're going to go ahead and end today's webinar. Webinar, And I want to thank everyone and thank you, Brendan, for taking the time to talk to us. Yeah, thanks, everybody. I appreciate your time. And everyone have a great rest of your day or your evening.